How are you? You all right? I'm good, yeah. And yourself? I'm all right, thank you, yeah. Um, this is Spanish Announce Table with Neil. Um, I contacted you in after um, Oliver Barrett was on our show talking about dyspraxia and he made a comment about it on one of his posts expressing how we quite, well, uh, wanted to come on and express his feelings about it. And that made me think how many wrestlers actually have like things like dyspraxia coordination issues like that. It really fascinates me because obviously it's something like I've got dyspraxia and it's, it's something that I thought... I don't think that was something that uh, somebody with dyspraxia could ever do was to train to be a wrestler. So, have you had any issues in the, when you were training, like getting things right, things like that? Well, uh, I think the, the best way to to look at it is that, like, I have all three, right? It's not that I'm being greedy, <laughs> but I'm dyslexic. Yes. It's calculate and <clears throat> and uh, dyspraxic as well, and I or maybe it's. it's probably developed into an inferiority complex. Yes. But and, uh, when I was younger, I, I, uh, this, this does tie into when I was training. Yes. But when I was younger, I wondered why tying my shoelaces was so difficult and yeah. riding a bike was difficult. But it's not as if I, uh, I couldn't do these things. I just had to persevere and find my own ways of, of doing things. And yeah. it was almost like things become instinctive, for me anyway. Yeah. And in a wrestling sense, I'd watched wrestling since I was about 10 years old, and I had a, a, like a, a feeling or an energy uh, when I came to train that almost I instinctively understood what I might need to do. So I've never had any real difficulty expressing myself, which is something I'd always struggled with. Like yeah. I, My writing looks like spiders. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. like as, a, as, as I say, like... Uh, it took me a long time to even learn how to do something simple like folding clothes. So when I was yes. younger, I just thought I was kind of maybe scruffy and haphazard, but it was I wasn't uh, clumsy. It was because I had problems with coordination. And the, the simple things, as I say, like tying shoelaces and uh, riding the bike, I, really, I just persevered. And if I ever came across any issues whilst training, it was getting myself into good habits whilst wrestling. So some things can be... Uh, wrestling's very sleight of hand at times. Yeah. So once you've got your own way of doing things, like <clears throat> I look back at myself running the ropes oh, years ago now, like I started in 2007, and I was really, really fast at doing it, but sometimes I would find myself not getting the bounce that I should. And okay, I'm a small wrestler. Yeah. And not every wrestler who's my size is going to hit the rope really, really hard. But it was I was coming to terms with understanding that whilst I'd watched wrestling on television, uh, me being in the ring was going to be a completely different scenario. So I learned how to almost pace myself and place my weight in places. And what I did was eventually got into the into good habits, which uh, over like kind of over riding any any I would say issues that I was maybe about to develop yeah. and I, I, I'm able to look back now and realise that once I understood my space my space sorry, and my size I had a greater awareness but I, I've throughout my entire life I've had mm -hmm. issues like I know I was in the scouts and yeah. the, like the cubs for years and uh, I couldn't do the simplest of the knots which is what they were incredibly difficult Whoa. but an abseiling knot one handed, <laughs> and uh, people thought this was incredible. Wow. Uh, uh, to me, it was so easy, and I watched as all these high level scouts doing the, the bowling knot, and yeah. they're going, Oh, the rabbit goes round the tree, down the hole, and I was looking at them <laughs> doing it one handed, and the leaders were saying, That's a really advanced way of doing it, and he's doing it like that, no problem. But it took me ages to learn the knots to do it. The, the way that I'd been shown, but the way that I came up with, I thought I came up with it, was just a natural, instinctive dealing with the situation kind of way. So it was how I discovered I could be ambidextrous in things like squash and yeah. uh, drumming and things like that. Once I got into a rhythm, I was able to, you know, adapt. So, yeah. So it's that was a long, long answer. It's all right. No, 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 I want a long answer, yeah. Um... Yeah, it's so you're basically saying practice makes perfect sort of thing. So as long as you yeah. work at it, you know, you'll get to the... And it was a, it was a 
enjoyment of it because if we were learning the Irish whips or we were learning a uh, like kind of sleep and leap kind of drill yeah. in, in class I I thought about what I was doing and that's like some people can just kind of naturally go into the ring and even if they're not great uh, when they first start training they can have a mindset of I've seen this on the television I have an idea of what's happening but sometimes I'll tell my body to do something and it won't do it the way I've expected yeah. so uh, I try and get ahead of schedule so that when I was in the ring I would be very deliberate about everything I did so every kind of hitting the mat uh, leaping over somebody for example I was very uh, very aware I think what it what, what, what I found anyway is I was aware of how much I would require moving, I mean, yeah. the distance I would require going, because when I was training, I was doing things like uh, like moonsaults, springboards, and stuff like that. Yeah. But when I started doing this, uh, the confidence really helped because I was quite confident. So yeah. I was springing and flying about, and I got quite used to how much I would require to throw myself. But for the first time, doing a lot of things, like, for example, like a lion salt, I was yeah. able to do that onto my feet years ago. Oh. And I got that almost right away. Some people practiced it for ages to make it look fantastic. However, uh, I oh, I almost needed to be switched on. You know what I yes. mean? If I went in and I, my heart wasn't into what I was doing, which would be the same with anybody, really. Yeah. But I would find my, uh, my, my body almost doing its own thing, which sounds weird, but if I went in the, without without really uh, my, without, without my mind being clouded without you know thinking about two or three things at once and just went in felt what I needed to do understand the premise but that's how I teach younger people when I train them now I say yeah. there's a reason for what you're doing in the ring right. they understand the reason for example I was having to uh, teach uh, in uh, Worldwide Wrestling League up here in Scotland yeah. uh, and, and I've done the numerous classes and some people have really struggled natural thing to hit the mat, yeah. you know, to, to fall forward, to fall back. But when I explain the premise of why they're landing in a particular way, where they're landing, and what they, like, for example, they're landing on the back, they're landing on the front, why would they be landing on the front? And one of the things I always say to people is that, think about Scotty Tilotti's flying face bust or the RKO from Randy Orton, oh, right. mainly what happens when you trip and fall on ice. You know, your hands come out naturally. But what yeah. you're doing when you fall into these wake falls is you're controlling your fall because falling legitimately, well, you're falling for real and unprotected, <laughs> helps a lot more. Yeah. So when you're landing on your front, you're controlling that so that your hands play apart, your legs play apart. When you spread out your body in a certain way to land, of course, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to feel delicious. <laughs> Then that lent itself to something that's usually difficult to people, which was typing. 
Yes. That's what I did when I was able. Uh, with, when I went to university and I yes. went to high school, uh, when I got to do my exams, they let me go on the computer for it, and I didn't even need to look at the keyboard because I could feel where all the letters numbers were. Wow. So, yeah, that's, I think that's why sometimes people tell me that I've got a good ring awareness of what I'm doing or I'm aware of where I'm facing if I need to be. Because I, I, I play a lot of wicked tricks in wrestling, yes. you've probably seen. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of like mess using the uh, weapons and stuff like that. A lot of that is sleight of hand, and it's almost like I position myself to see where an audience can't see, if you know what I mean. And uh, I have to, I'm almost instantly aware because I'm used to expecting that I'm not going to be aware. Yeah. Catch me. Yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds really clever, actually, like, to find, like, a, a different way around it rather than trying to go the usual route. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, I mean, me and me and Oliver were just saying uh, when he was on the show that he had trouble with his shoelaces, I had trouble learning how to drive a car, and he, he doesn't know how to drive a car, and, and I said it took me two years to actually get to the test, and he said, yeah, oh, wow. well, that's... Well, wait, wait here, this, I failed my driving test eight times. Right. And, uh, <laughs> The thing is, though, now, if you were to see me on the road, a lot of people describe me as almost smooth as silk with the way that I drive. Yeah, yeah, it's the same with me. I have my own way, but it's it's, it's the right way. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, though, because I've got, I was so used to having to be, well, not quick on the draw, but because of the way I got used to driving, I got yeah. reasonably efficient at it. And that's why when I, and I don't understand it, these are, these are people as well who would look at me like I climbed out of the sea if I was walking. <laughs> these are people that are maybe going at 40 and 60 and they'll slow down and they'll do whatever. And I'm already prepared for the fact that I can see the roundabout. I can see eight cars ahead, yeah. but there's nothing there. And there's people slowing down. And if it's something like that, and I think, look, they're, they're slowing down. I don't know where they're going, but I do. Not only do I spot myself in the position to where I'm going, but I'm almost ready to, to pull off by the time I've got to the round and I see nobody. And sometimes people look at me as if to go, wow, what road magic has this man done? <laughs> I don't know what I've done. As I've, I'm aware that my body reacts very quickly, but at the same time, yeah. it's not always reacting the, right way. the way I want it. Yeah. So I'm jumping ahead of schedule almost to catch it before it makes a mistake. And I've got so used to doing that I can disguise it. Like, again, to go back to wrestling, if I, and a lot of the time, I'll do something and I think, wow, I've botched that, that'll look terrible. And I'll look back in uh, the footage and I'll go, wow, it was smoother than I thought. How did that happen? And I realised, because I'm underestimating myself, but not just that, it's that I felt for an instant that little, uh, it's, well, we can, it sounds ominous, but we'll call it a shudder. Yes. At the moment that you know it, the moment where you think, I can feel myself about to do this wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't totally know that way. You think, yeah. I've done that wrong. It's happening. It's happening now. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, I've just... but the way I counteract it is I'll go, I, I've done this wrong. Yes. And my body recovers quickly. And I think the best example is, I saw this footage back. I was actually giving Bobby Roberts. <laughs> right. Uh, you would know that I've seen in the North East scene by now. A guy from Scotland that used to do the... Uh, Stone Cold Bobby Roberts. Yes, that. yes, I know of him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, he was, I was out to drop kick his knee from under him and uh, make a tag in a tag team match. And he ran into me perfectly fine. But when I wow. drop kicked, I realised I dropped and almost extended before he reached me. Yes. But uh, I drop kicked really quickly. And I thought, oh man, I don't I think I got much, because uh, I was only taking his knee out, but I thought, I don't know if I got much connection at all. Wow. But given the precision and what I was aiming for, when I actually do this drop kick, it does look incredibly smooth, and Bobby sails over the top of me and out of the ring. Uh, I go through the middle rope, and I thought, wow, to me, I felt that was terrible, and for the rest of the match, I was up in my game trying to make things look better, because I thought that would have looked shoddy, and it, it didn't, but yeah. it's because I got that first feeling of the shudder. I felt I missed timing. I felt that it was my fault, and I felt that my body wasn't prepared. But looking back, I'd corrected myself mid-motion. All oh, right. It, because it was so quick, like I'd gone to drop kick, and I hadn't hesitated. I just I didn't levitate or anything. I 
Yeah. That you're, you're used to the apprehension and anticipation of a mistake. Yes. Whilst you're getting annoyed at yourself for making the physical error, your body's already saying, no, we've got this. We've got this. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm like that because I'm, I can be quite, I can do my worst. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that because, like, I mean, there yeah. is times when I do things a different way, and then somebody will stop us and go, "No, no, you don't do it like that." And I, I, I say, "Wait, just let me do it." I can't really think of an example, but there is things I do differently to people, and they're like, "No, no, that's not how I do it." I'm like, "Well, this yeah, is that, how, that's I do it. how I do it." But they don't, they haven't given you a chance your way, which is probably interesting when that would be the way that you've adapted to do it. Yeah. The perfect story that isn't long is I was uh, I worked in Asda when I was I mean I worked in Asda when I wrote the Sparky to wrestle. Before I started wrestling, I was serving pizzas. And if anyone's listening, you should never get a job in Asda ever. Don't work in retail, it's stupid. But, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good thing. You can go and get a pizza at three in the morning, but don't work there. That's <laughs> but I remember they were saying to me, and it was almost like because people who aren't dyspractic or don't have a high level of dyspraxia yeah. don't understand it. Because oh. they're the kind of people that can, you know, the people that write really neatly or the people that can... Uh, you know, fold sheets. Yeah, yeah. Look like that they've tried to chew them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> can kind of work in, you know, new look and you can take a t shirt and swing it around your head, throw it on the ground, you know, <laughs> fill it with these and then hand it back to them and they'll just fold it and they go perfect. Whereas I couldn't I'd have to you know, I No, no. I'd have to I'd have to get one of those mad T shirt folding bits of plastic. The bits of plastic, yeah, yeah. But I'm 
arm, but any elbow curve is holding on to things like two or three yeah. fingers. If I'm not holding the elbows, they're getting in the one arm. I mean, if you were to see me shop in Asda, I don't carry a bag. I put everything in a, in a box, anything heavy in the box, and everything else is kind of something's in my arm, put something's in the elbow curve, something's under my chin. Because <laughs> if I was to start carrying it in my arms, the stuff would slip out. I'd start to. Almost yeah. All this stuff, I have to be holding it in that unusual way. As weird as it sounds, it's the way I hold on to it, and it's that's easier yeah. for me. It's as bizarre as it sounds, but it's easier for me than uh, carrying, carrying it in a basket. Normal person. Yeah, I, I'm like that actually. I find ways of carrying things, like, and carry a lot of bottles at the same time. Like in different kind of like gaps in my body, that's uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. relatable, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's exactly what it is, and that's why if someone was to do, right, like for example, because uh, I carry a spade to the ring, yes, I uh, I might be coming towards a wrestling event with the spade in my hand, my backpack on one arm, and my arm through the pulley out bit on my case. Mm. People might say that can't be efficient. I think you'd be surprised how much more comfortable I'm finding this than holding the spade, pulling the, the case. And wearing the bag on my back because uh, the, I'll find myself coming to a door yes. and putting everything down to open the door. And as soon as I try and walk through the door, even if I open the door wide, the bag's getting caught, yeah. and there's all knock. And what I will do though, if I'm going through the door and I'm holding this, the spade in one hand, my hand is straight through the, the case, and I've got my backpack on, I'll almost close like a clam and go straight through the door in a one and it's just bizarre as it sounds. It's almost like uh, I'm, I'm expecting everything to get caught, so I bring everything close to my being and hold on to it that way. Uh, so I've, I've been like that when I've been wrestling abroad in Germany as well. People have come to pick me up, and I'm almost wearing my suitcase. Yeah, yeah. And, and my and people will say, "Why have you tied your, you know, the my like from my jacket or something?" Yeah. It'll be like two toggles. I'll have tied that to a bag that's resting at my stomach. I have a backpack on one side of me, and another bag that I've got is probably wrapped around my wrist. And people will say, "Why? Why are you carrying stuff like this?" And I think because I'm moving a lot quicker and a lot further, and I'm not catching on things. It sounds weird to anyone listening who's not distracted. to go like, "Why not just carry it normally?" Yeah. But but I can because when I start carrying the case properly, it catches on every little bump I go over. It spins out of control. Uh, I find my wrist twitching when I'm trying to manoeuvre it. So the best thing to do is actually bring it close to me and use the strength that I've got to manoeuvre it in a different way. It's not hurting me, but if I've got to, if I'm, I put my arm through the hole and I'm carrying it that way, that's the best way for me, you know, so. Oh, right. Well, yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's just different ways of doing things, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of, I mean, it's different to what, Oliver was saying that he had to just pretty much, well, it's actually the same, he had to pretty much take his time and find out ways of doing things. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's different. I mean, I mean, can I ask, just going way back to the beginning of your career, how did you get into wrestling? Because obviously with your, like, knowing that you've got dyspraxia, dyslexia, how did you get into wrestling in the first place, as in, like, well, competing? I, uh, I knew, uh, without this being a huge, long story, I went to school with a girl, and this girl, later in life, Married a guy who worked in a uh, game station. Well, nice. uh, eventually became game. Yes. In Kirkcaldy, where I lived. And that man was uh, tenacious Johnny Lyons. Right. And I was speaking to him because I knew his wife, because uh, I'd gone to school with her. And because I'd been to a wrestling event that was held by the World Wide Wrestling League in a hotel, which was not too far from where I lived, in Kirkcaldy. Uh, and I, I went there and I actually, I saw guys like Wolfgang and Darkseid and interestingly enough, Tim Strange. Oh, Tim, Tim good old Strange. Tim, well, uh, he's good sometimes. <laughs> Tim Strange, well, we've got a bit of a uh, bit of heat with him at the minute, but go on, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 um, basically his uh, manager, if you want to call him that, keeps coming on our show and uh, spreading Let's Call the Propaganda about Tim Strange, but yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> We can't, I think that, I think I might have seen something like that going down at MPW. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I got to see the live feed as I was recovering from a torn quad. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> and, may have noticed. Yes, yeah, so my but, colleague's yeah. got a bit uh, upset with him. But anyway, yeah, carry on. Oh, I understand. Well, look at this way. I saw these guys, uh, like Iceman and uh, Phil Powers and Mickey Knight. Oh, Mickey Knight, yeah. These well, were guys that were working around the scene in 2006. 
Yes. So I, I thought, you know what, I've always wanted to give wrestling a try. And I'd just finished university. I'd been living in Portugal for a bit. And I was going to go back. But at the same time, I thought, you know what, I'd, I'd like to do it. And I, I'd i always, like, I'd, I'd done a degree in drama and theatre arts. So mm. that, that was a kind of no-brainer. I was already able to play a character. And I, I had already been, I hadn't been intensely going to the gym. But it had been something that I thought, you know what, if you actually put your mind to it, maybe you could get into good shape. Because I just looked like every other human being, basically. Yes. And I, a part of me was like, you know, if you're going to rest, you might as well go to the gym. But I spent more time, I think, going to the gym in the early days before I trained. Yes. Thinking that I was going to go in and everybody was going to be cut from solid rock. Yes. And even then everybody was like, you know, a human being. And I was like, oh, okay. But anyway, I went to this wrestling event in Kirkcaldy. Ended up seeing Stu or Johnny Lyons uh, and finding out that he's, you know, he'd married a girl I went to school with. I ended up going into game and game station uh, a couple of days later and she was telling me, yeah, you should start training, you should do this. Told me where to go. I then passed my driving test mm-hmm. to be able to drive to the uh, to where, where the training was for the Worldwide yeah. Wrestling League. Oh, wow. That's kind of how it began. Like it was only a couple of times over, but I thought, you know what, I can't rely on somebody to get me lifts. I'm certainly not relying on buses. Yeah. I'm going to, learn, I, I'm going to, like, I'm going to really knuckle down and get this driving test done. And I'd failed eight times prior, and I thought, no, I want to be a professional wrestler. I don't want to wait about, you know, no. getting, you know, drive, getting a lift into work or driving my, or driving, pedaling my bike into work. Yeah. I'm going to pass my driving test. I'm going to become a professional wrestler. And that was it. I took one session in the summer of 2006 and then came back uh, late 2006, uh, early 2007. And within three months after that, I was wrestling because I, I don't think I missed a class. I went to every single uh, class I could get to because there was a ring at that training facility. It was cold, it was wet, and it was damp at the time. Not the ring, just the facility. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, uh, I went and I, I went uh, under the under, well, in, in the understanding that I possibly would be the smallest person there, but I was yeah. not going to let that stop me. And when I got there, it was a it was a fantastic thing because if you've ever been at school or any kind of further education or anything yeah. ever, if somebody says, "All right, okay, today we're going to learn about you know the, the history of the textile industry," you have mm-hmm. to really really care about the textile industry to want to sit and learn about it. But when yeah. you went to a class and you heard, tonight we're going to learn how to do drop kicks <laughs> and then we're going to cut promos, I thought, this is fantastic. <laughs> so obviously I'm going to drop kick with a drop kick in my punching bag and stuff like that. And I thought, like, a part of me was like, you're going to miss, you're going to do this, because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm dyspraxic. And it's, uh, as much as it can be my own at times, I didn't want to you know, be shown up in front of these people. As it turned out, I had one of the best drop kicks in the class. <laughs> I 
fashion. And I was I was mistiming things, and uh, it wasn't as if it was a, a botch or I was clumsy. It was just me getting used to how things are working. Like I never preempted bumps. For example, they they showed me how to back bump, and I did a neck bump on my first a bump. Yeah. And some of the guys had never ever done anything more than a back bump and a front bump, and they were going, "Wow, that's like you've just been clotheslined and spit out." And it's like be be a lot more gentle. Don't jump so high. <laughs> Uh, you know, don't go down with such yeah know, thing to do with distance, isn't it? You yeah, know, I was I was giving more than I probably should have at the time. But then when it came to neck bumping, I was really good at it. So yeah, yeah. But that's the when I got involved. I always knew that that was going to be something. If you know what I mean. I yeah, knew. I totally yeah, I totally get what you mean. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Oliver said it as well. He said. He has to, well, he doesn't bring it up unless somebody asks him, but he does if he's training, he has to, like, tell the trainer, look, right, I to struggle, so... And then they usually understand and, and help him, but, uh, yeah, it's it's not something... I mean, does, has it ever got in the way of in training, or, like, uh, I mean, I know you've uh, your struggles, or, well, like, promotions, has anyone said, no, I'm not putting you in the ring, sort of thing? No, uh, the, the interesting thing is that when I say to people, uh, I mean, recently as well, I know I said people said my driving was as smooth as silk, <laughs> Some people have worked with me recently and just said you just flow so well doing some things in the ring. Like some people either don't, they do feel me. I don't mean I, I yeah. really disappear through. Yeah. They know I'm there. But folk have, have noticed that I've fed in a way or I've manoeuvred myself in a way for their benefit. And mm-hmm. I've probably done that ahead of schedule. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm knowing that my body has a tendency to sometimes do its own thing. Right. I've had a problem. I've had... Some people say in the early days, like, why are you doing that when you bump? Why did you do this before a clothesline? To try it, and this is what it was harsher. If you'd speak to any guys that trained before 2007 and 2008, they'll tell you how there was a lot more experienced guys who were waiting on a reason to stop you from taking their spot. Ah, it was, I see. And being, being five foot two and a bit nine stone at the time, I was, I was never bullied, bullied. I was an easy target for someone who was going to say, I'll body slam you. If you feed up, then I'll do this. And it was their way of saying, I'll body slam you and I'm going to kick you in the back as hard as possible. If you survive that, then maybe you'll come back, you know. So uh, I, I can remember being uh, kind of given a hard time for saying, oh, you're not clotheslining hard enough or, you know, you're doing this with your arm or when I slam you and you do a double bump, that's yeah. because you can't bump. And it wasn't that. It was more of a case of, hey, I'm still learning, you know. So yeah. I'm being powerbombed by a guy who's looking to put me through the mark because he thinks it's a hard case and wouldn't win a real fight in real life. Of course, I'm, uh, I'm trying to, to give my very best. But in my early days, uh, it was, it, I was also working with people who maybe weren't as quick as me or, or whatever. So uh, it was never actually my fault. But I've never had complaints the vast majority of, of what I've done. There has been the odd occasion where I've gone to strike somebody. Yes. And maybe they're fed in an incorrect way for them. I've gone in with so much gusto that I've clocked them. And I know yeah. that I've done that to uh, uh, Mike Musso many years ago. And this was in front of Johnny Kidd, of all people, as well. Wow. And uh, Mike, came in, Mike came flying into the corner and I moved out of the way. And as he was selling his post, there we are, just ripping wrestling apart. For everyone to hear, the end and out, as, uh, as Mike selling in the corner, I knew this was my time to elbow him. So I was, I was going to give him an elbow in the corner. Oh, there's an alarm going off. I'll just, uh, I'll just have to ignore that. Uh, I, uh, I gave Mike this elbow, but because I was doing it with such gusto and I just went for it, I could see that Mike was leaning forward. He was still selling. And I thought, I can't stop myself. I can't withdraw this elbow. I've, and I couldn't stop my body. Yeah. Just, I knew I had to elbow. And it was almost like I let autopilot take over. And I caught him a cropper right across the bridge of my nose and busted wow. his nose. Uh, and I thought, it's terrible. I would never have drawn blood from anyone. It, was a clum- it wasn't a clumsy shot. But it, was, it was my body acting ahead of what I meant to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, I totally know. I, I, yeah. I automatically went and I was like, wow, I've just studied him right in the face. Uh, and I apologised whilst I was doing it and he was like, look, it happens. And my gear was covered in blood when I came back. And I remember I was saying to Johnny Kidd, of all people, a, you know, a fantastic world of sport, you know, wrestler. And there I am drawing blood from one of my trainers and he was saying, it happens. 
So it's not the, you know, it's not the first time we've seen somebody take a knock. It's just it was a, 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 you know, a miscalculation. But I've never ever been not people have not worked with me yeah. for that reason. People know that I don't mean to clock someone. And in fact, it was last year I think I was working with Future Shock Tom Fulton. Yeah. And I went to do a, a kind of base, not a base, most of a soccer ball kick to the gut. And I think that. I, I didn't do the move wrong and Tom didn't take it wrong, but we met in the middle and quite possibly were the wrong way because I gave myself an extra step. So I think he breathed out instead of tensing. Oh, right. When I threw, up my, when I threw my foot into his midsection, I usually just get a tap and the rest is all theatrics. It's the, yes. the swinging of the leg and the, the way that I was spot. But I think Tom breathed out just at the time I swung my leg, so I actually did legit kick him in the gut. And uh, I sent him rolling, and I thought, wow, that that felt like I actually hit him. And I had him in the corner, and I was choking him. I said, are you okay? And he was, he was winded. He was going, give me a minute, give me a minute. So I'm, I'm a villain, and I go, and I, I antagonize yeah, the crowd yeah. for a bit. And I felt awful. And that was all down to my... It was because I threw an extra step into what I was doing, which I wouldn't normally have done. Yes. I think it's because the ring was bigger, but I hadn't uh, preempted that. Yeah. I've never, ever thrown a strike in the ring that's been deliberately yeah. armed uh, and, and anything else except for the fact that maybe I've thought my strikes were a bit weak looking or I've maybe you know I could I've uh, maybe thought I need to up the ante here as a physical match or whatever but uh, no one's ever not worked with me for it but there's people who have come back a lot of the times and said oh you hit, you hit me really hard there but to me it's not been intentional yes, you know what yeah. I mean a lot of the time I've come back and I think a, a couple of guys have said oh you caught me really with that first forearm or that first drop kick and I, I, I've always said it's not been intentional yes if I keep totally. flying in there with a reason to hit you it was the positioning we were in and it was probably the mad fervour of my energy their energy the adrenaline has knocked me slightly off balance yeah. like, I, I know what's happening there's times where I've been sent to the ropes I've ran the ropes I've been aware that when I've been sent my hand has almost slipped on the ropes because I've yeah. been so full of adrenaline that I've been a little bit, not not that it's obvious, but I mean, I've, I've wrestled with Jay, and yes. Jay will probably be able to say the same thing, is that I've maybe come in uh, 110 miles an hour more than I've meant to, and it's just because I had adrenaline flowing. And uh, like, I think Jay, well, Jay's somebody that, and, and in fact, if you look at uh, Oliver Barrett's ring work, he's fantastic. He's managed to get over, uh, in my opinion, he's managed to get over uh, any issues with dyspraxia are really, really well. It's quite hard. You know, I, I knew he was dyspraxic when he, he told me years ago. Yes. I don't know I was. But I look at his stuff and think he's naturally talented. The only problem is, is that I think he's got the same thing as me, is that he can recover quickly and he's aware of what his body's doing, but he just can't stop it. Yeah, that's true. That's what yeah. I mean. That's what yeah, I I, sometimes, as I say, I'm getting sent to the ropes 110 miles an hour and I'm grabbing the ropes like I remember. But I've hit the ropes so hard and the ropes are bouncy that my hand has just slid off. And I find myself coming towards somebody with a clothesline that's going to catch them a bit. And yeah. sometimes, you know, there's not a problem. And I'm not clumsy. But there mm. are times where someone will go, yeah, that was a pretty solid line. But that's how I like it, so that's fine. But other times I feel guilty because I've maybe gone through someone like a fart through a colander. And I thought, oh no. I ended up getting the poor Yorkshire Bale yeah, really yeah. hard ones. And it wasn't because I meant it, it's because I was preparing the forearm and when he got up to his feet. But I was already going for his forearm as he slowly fed up and I watched this. I thought, I'm going to catch him before he feeds up properly yeah. and I'm going to hit the poor cat, mate. And I didn't mean to, but my arm was going and I just couldn't stop it. I could not stop it. So yeah, that's it. That's an example of it. But I've never been so sloppy or so stiff. No, 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 of I've course. wanted to work with me. But... There's, there has been that odd occasion where people have said, oh, you, the kick you gave me to, you know, the chest or whatever was really good. But that, that first push-off, oh man, that was quite solid. And I'll find myself apologising. And it's, it's because I've maybe put, as I say, a lot more behind something than I probably should have. Mm -hmm. And even that, there's a, a clip from an old W3L show. Yes. Where I got whipped into the corner and kids fight in my ring and, and he told me to hit him. He told oh, yeah. me to deliver a solid forearm, so I did, <laughs> he, I think, he, I, I think the, the spot was that I moved, he hit the turnbuckle, and I, he 
that round, I was to deliver this big forearm. Yeah. I did, but the speed that we were going at when he fed round, I caught him. He then punched me for real, and after the match, he was saying, oh. sorry, I thought you were trying to do me in there, and I was like, no, no, I was, <laughs> I was trying to match your pace. It's just when you spun round so quickly, I didn't realise you were going to do it, and I just swung my arm in there and uh, clocked him. Now, after people hear this, not going to want to work with it, but I think he hits really hard. <laughs> oh, well, past him. But that's not the real reason at all. The, the real uh, the real thing is, is that sometimes I'll find, uh, like, I might, as I say, I might be hitting ahead of schedule because I'm I'm, I'm going fast all the yes, time. Yes, yeah. Uh, it, very, it very rarely happens. When it does happen, I'm always apologising for it. Yes. I'm always making people aware that it's not intentional. And there's the one thing that I do do when I'm in the ring is a... Uh, if I, have, if I feel like I've hit anybody hard and they're down or they're feeding, I go straight in for a choke if I'm a villain or if I'm a, a face. I always make sure I ask the referee, are yeah. they okay? Because, yeah. you know, dirty shots happen. I never oh, yeah. do it intentionally and it's very rare for me. But if it has happened, I, I always say something. But even when I come back, the match is now asked, is everything okay for you? Well, obviously, more often than not, yeah, everything's fine. But... Those times where I'm saying, look, I'm really sorry if I hit you with that knee, or... Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm, I've delivered it really solidly, but I must, I must not hit as hard as I think I do. Because no, 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 that's it. A lot more people say, oh, no, you're absolutely fine. <laughs> I can feel, I can feel the adrenaline behind it, it was maybe not the level yeah, yeah, I wanted. Yeah, yeah. It's like being heavy-handed without wanting to be. You know, you've exactly. got people that are clumsy, just yeah, naturally. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like I've been far too heavy-handed because I've just been full of adrenaline and pacing and I've, I'm really going for it and yeah so now and again I do feel I feel bad like I've cut somebody and as I say more often than not that I haven't but if I have done it's never ever been intentional to hurt although I've been in the ring with guys who just hit sloppily and clumsy anyway because they can <laughs> so yeah, yeah. they're not even bothered whether or not you survive at the end of it <laughs> That's it, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's definitely answered a few questions, and I mean, it's obviously it's a, a case of curiosity, isn't it? Um, seeing as we're going into the new year, I mean, what have you got coming up in 2020, or what have you not got coming up, should I say? Well, uh, one second, I'm going to take a short break. For anyone listening to this, I should announce the uh, show right now. <laughs> it's me drinking pink Lucasade. Lovely. Uh, you can take that little sound bite and repeat it constantly. For relaxation purposes. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, as you know, I was meant to be, well, I don't know if you were, you were out there, weren't you, at the last Halloween, the MPW uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Halloween show. I couldn't go there because I had seen an injury when the alpha male, uh, I swept his legs out from under him because of a hard case, and he came down onto my knee. Now, again, that's a dyspraxia factor. Right. Excuse me, I, uh, I did the spot as I should have done. Yeah. But uh, the, the, his knee slammed into my quad, it hurt, but mm. uh, the way that I uh, continued the match, I, I mean, it was absolutely fine at the time, but mm. the level of dyspraxia I noticed when I looked back at the clip, as I swing my leg in fine, but almost to compensate for him falling, I withdraw my leg a second too late, and which is exactly why uh, oh, right. I got hurt. But it's, it, was a, it was a kind of miscalculation of both. He's just getting back into being into the ring, doing very well, but just getting back into being in the ring. So there was not a timing issue as such. It was just that, again, he was flying into me with such adrenaline as I was flying into him. But the point is, is that uh, I think if I hadn't been, Done that. Uh, had that split second, I probably wouldn't be walking because uh, wow. our legs locked together with some force. Anyhow, uh, that weekend I had a tour. I did matches. Uh, the next week I go to get involved for uh, MPW after not being able to wrestle one weekend. Fantastic. Leg was so swollen. Discovered that I've torn uh, a part of my uh, quad muscle. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be at a W3L event yes. in uh, Dalkeith. Uh, Worldwide Wrestling League in Dalkeith and they're also going to be in Grangemouth on Sunday. But Ooh. for next year, 2020, uh, I have, uh, I don't want to officially say things just now because I've been talking to several people. I should hopefully be appearing for three, well, returning to one place and appearing for two new places. But coming to the end of this month, I'll be in uh, for, for Scottish Wrestling Entertainment. I have a shot, uh, maybe 
maybe reclaim the Future Division Championship up uh, north here uh, in Scotland. I say up north, they're in the east. It'll be in Dundee, which is kind uh, of north. But uh, yeah, uh, that uh, that event is coming up. I think this will probably be my uh, I'm guessing the way that I often get booked as well. I wrestle frequently, but yes. never ever seem to get as many title shots as I'd quite like. Because oh, I, I would quite like a bit more title matches. I don't think it's Matty May when I was injured. <laughs> so uh, I know, I imagine that. The one, first one I'd had in a long time and that happened. And you got injured. Yeah. Well, if there's any pro- right. promoters listening, uh, you and one's more title shots. I'm sure you'll get some I now. <laughs> subject to change is what they use isn't it that yes, thing, yes yeah. are they subject to change however there should be a return to maximum pro wrestling on the cards hopefully hopefully I'm going to be going down south a bit more Ooh. now uh, and, and I mean further than like the Midlands <laughs> and more uh, more time spent in, in London potentially Ooh. wrestling okay. but uh, the way I'm looking at it I'm not saying anything official Ooh. not hiding anything from anybody I just want to get things kind of Yes, as far yes, as uh, course, 2020 course. is concerned, I do know that the first day for Scottish Wrestling Entertainment and for W3L, I will be appearing. And I'm hoping if things are going to plan, and this, you know, the, the dates are going to go off as they should, then hopefully 2020 will be my year to get not so much back on track, but it will be my opportunity yeah. to uh, not even start with a clean slate. I think the best way to describe it as I've been given actual reasons to anyone yes. listening there. I just thought I'd been eating falafel <laughs> before this uh, phone call. Uh, if you want to rewind constantly and listen to me barking again for therapeutic relaxing purposes, <laughs> I think if you so desire. Uh, yes, what I, I'm looking forward to in 2020 is that the promotions that I do work for frequently yes. started to give me more of a role. And I don't mean in training or in booking or anything like yeah. that. But what they have given me is I've, I've bizarrely enough been asked, what would you like to do? Yes. And yeah. imagine that. I know it was a long preamble for it. I've been given the fact that we'd like you to compete for this belt. We think, you know, we think that your particular brand of characterisation and wrestling lends itself really well to this yeah. style of match and, and programme we'd like to do. Are you interested? Yes. Mm. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, I've been asked, who would you like to work with? Mm. I've never, I mean, there's some wrestlers around the country who get to pretty much pick the fingers and get to work with anyone they want. Yeah. Then it was almost a case of you and you just work with this guy, you know. And very little, not, not, not as if it was very little focus, it was almost a case of can you work with this person? I'm happy to work with this person. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, it's a, a, a couple of times people have said, oh, such and such, when we had a few matches, but we know that you'll work well with them. And I think brilliant will make the match about them. Uh, as you said earlier, uh, we were talking to me about G. Adams and uh, yes, uh, he's not really Jack Knoxville anymore, is he? Classic Jack. Jack, classic Jack. Uh, and I've enjoyed working with both of them, and it's great to see them getting on. But there's times where I've been, uh, I've been told I'm working with them, so I think, okay, uh, I hope that I give them the best. It's yeah. almost like I've not been so much developmental talent, but what I've been is an almost in-ring lesson. Yes, yes. I'm not saying, oh wow, I'm more experienced than everybody. It's more of a, they are not going to find another person like me yes. that can wrestle. But Bit of a challenge. If they, wrestle, if they wrestle me and it works out good for them and they learn a couple of things, yes. that's part of the learning experience because they're going to wrestle, you know, kick pad wearing Chris Water and John Fire and whatever <laughs> bizarre crap create a wrestler name. They then the rest are going to wrestle. But there's only one you and G Mackey. Exactly. He's going to give you a certain story in that match that you're going to have very rarely with anyone else. And if I see people taking the premise, not such a spot that I've done, but if they take the premise of a match, and it was Joey Legend that said to me, he said this recently, I yeah. anything that he's said over the years since I've known him, but he said, all you need to do is look at the two wrestlers you've got and you've got a story already. And I thought, 
you're yes. right. You might have a guy that's you know almost immovable, a big guy, and there's a technician in there. Uh, what's the technician's best deal is to maybe wear the guy down and try and get him to submit, or try and pin him in a clever way. Whereas the big guy obviously doesn't want to get caught by this guy's uh, technical equipment. You know, in my case, I'm unpredictable, and I use that to my strength. And oh. I would be able to work with any opponent. So what I mean is that things are coming up in the new year. Mm -hmm. Right. So, main events, for example, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, I can't expose it because these things are in the works, the match graphics. Are yeah, you can't really, yeah, you can't really reveal too much, but, I understand. But yeah. what I would like to say about 2020, should I be injury-free going into the new year, because the, the dates that I've got so far, I think I've got maybe 10, 11, maybe, maybe 12 matches or 12 shows left till the new year and I'm hoping that through November I've got maybe 12 of a match I would say about 9 or 10 mm -hmm. I've got the the opportunity to rest and make sure that my muscle heals yes. but at the same time I'm not slowing down so I'm quite happy to have a reduced role and I don't mean reduced as in not resting I mean the matches I've got on the card I'm a tiny little Lego sized building block in comparison <laughs> to happening in the event if you know what I mean yeah I totally know and what you I'm, mean yeah, yeah. as much as I'm getting a title shot at the end of the month all of this is me playing a part a tiny little cog in the machine of the wrestling event next year I've been given a lot more opportunities to actually call the shots and I've never had that you know I'm, I'm being I mean I've, I've been able to come up with a creative angle but I've never been the one that has fully you know who would you like to wrestle you how would you like to do it what do you think would be the best idea here I'm thinking Wow, I've been asked my opinion. <laughs> I've never yeah, yeah. really been asked that before. So I'm hoping that, I, I mean, it'd be fantastic to hold one or two belts by the end of the year, regardless of what people say. If a promoter and the locker room as well uh, want you to wear a championship to represent a company, that is an honour. As much as it's a prop, it's still an honour that people put you that on that place on a card and yes. think that you will add to the product by doing that. Oh. But when I've been told uh, that I might be picking up gold in various different divisions, mm -hmm. in the places I've mentioned, or even just appearing to have a title match, yes. I'm excited. I don't need to win, but what oh. I do need to do is put on the kind of caliber of match. If somebody wants me to put on a main event style match, yes. I, mean, I usually find myself in 15 minutes. Like I'm never really in main events, and it's not because I couldn't do that style of a match. Yes. But it's more of a case that I don't need to, you know. Uh, people have already got their main event guys to be on a card. Now, I'm not saying, oh, wow, I'm going to send money. A that would be nice. But <laughs> what I mean is that I'm given the chance to create a premise only I can. So I think that that's what I love. Like, I, 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 I wrestled guys that are twice my size and had great marks with them. I wrestled people that are the same size as me. I wrestled girls. Yes. I've enjoyed doing it. But I've, I've actually got the luxury of being able to wrestle almost anyone and tell a story and for me to adapt to that story where it protects the wrestler I'm against, classic Jack's example. Yes. Uh, and and G Adams, in fact they're perfect examples. She G is a woman. Uh, she's she had a belt in UCW at the time I was wrestling her. I had a perfect reason as to why I was quite happy to kick her ass. Uh, <laughs> I ended up making her look good as somebody you don't mess with. In the case of Jack did the same thing, tried to make him look uh, great in the ring. Yeah. Well, which he is. I tried to make him look like a conceivable future superstar. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. But what that meant is that they had to come through the test of somebody who's unpredictable and dangerous because I was playing a villain. What this means is if I'm able to, I can do this with anybody. Now, if I'm told, or if I'm given the range of who would you like to bring in, I think I know how I could help somebody. Yes. And myself, uh -huh. by saying, I'd like to wrestle this first. It doesn't need to be a belt line, it doesn't need to be the main event of a show, but the style of match that we're going to do is one that's going to tell a story which benefits me, but also benefits the person coming in, so that they have a, almost like a. It's, like, it's not like I'm looking for a particular criteria of person. I just think that a, without going into classic wrestling tropes and cliches, I can get a good match out of somebody without doing. Too much. We don't have to sell it as a, a you know, as uh, well. You need to shift tickets. Shifting yeah. tickets is important because people need to get ingrained in a story first and get their teeth into something. And I think I can do that. I think I can. Mm. I can make people want to see a match. So if I've got the, uh, if I'm allowed to kind of choose what direction I'm taking things in, in a lot of the promotions I work for, well, I do three of them. But if I'm allowed to, uh, I mean, I, I agree that I'm allowed to kind of choose my 
that direction. The other places, I'm just quite happy to go. If you need me to, to do a 15 minute match, I'm absolutely fine with that. But if I get the opportunities that I, I have been uh, offered, mm-hmm. and I get to, to choose opponents, wrestle for various titles, or wrestle in the styles of matches, and I think it doesn't need to be about me. But I've got a really good idea to maybe sell this, to maybe yes. make this different, unique, something that people are going to watch. And something that when I finish wrestling, I can look back and go, that was an idea I always wanted to do, and I'm glad I got to do it. You know? Mm, yeah, I totally know what you mean, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, some people are, all they want to do is come into wrestling and learn how to powerbomb somebody. Whereas I wasn't bothered about the, the move so much. Even in my early days, I showed off by doing like Springboard 450s and stuff. It's yeah. not about that. I mean, now I'd like for someone to go, that was watchable. I could watch that again and again. Or that story, I was emotionally invested. Oh yeah, and that's what that's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I want to do. Uh, so I want to I want to really build things. I want people to not. I don't want to just keep doing the bait and switch like wrestling does on the TV. Yeah, I mean, I want to just bring in a good, wholesome focus. That's why I have a friend who uh, wanted to run a wrestling event. And now I know enough people that can promote that have access to rings. And I thought, you know what? If I if I get my opportunities in various places. I might also not try promoting. I'm not going yeah. to go and do that. But I can help build a show, build an event and build something that's ma- like a manageable chunk. Which you can I'd probably agree with me. Mm-hmm. Wrestling can get over-complicated and over-saturated if people aren't careful. Yeah, I totally see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, and people steal ideas from all over the place. Of course. It's fine. But I have a premise, a simple premise that I want to put into action next year. Hopefully it'll be for me entirely, but if it's show concepts or actual promotional ideas, I'm hoping I get to do them. Even if I even one or two, I'd be happy. I could retire from wrestling as a happy man. You know, like I say, next year I'm hoping that's what's on the cards. My own sway, my own look into things, and hopefully a, a few more higher profile matches. And, and by higher profile, I mean championships, and hopefully uh, more well-known wrestling individuals I mean I, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of years to wrestle people from all over and I'd like that to continue but mm-hmm. next year I hope that uh, I get the uh, as I say have those opportunities to create control the direction that I'm going in yeah. motions and see where that leads I mean uh, maybe maybe I'm up my own arse I think everything's <laughs> worked really well but part of me is thinking it would be really really exciting been asked what do you want to do it's time to show them it's almost time to book yourself in a way and I'm a bit I might not sound modest mm-hmm. I don't want to just be you know I just don't want to steamroll over everybody like I'm Brock Lesnar yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I think about this is that now I've been given the opportunity to pick and choose I'm thinking well I'm not just bucking you know any fly in or any big famous rest but I think I can find somebody and give them something to start their rest yeah. Well, it's helping me, and uh, it would be great to explore that. So yeah, that's what I'm looking for in 2020. And as I say, hopefully, uh, getting to work a couple of more places. There's some places I've been unable to because I've already been wrestling start on Saturdays, or I've not been able to. But I've been told uh, that perhaps working together will be there in the future. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm hoping that uh, things aren't going to be left up in the air. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, right, well, uh, well, you've got loads to think about then, haven't you? Um, well, that's been brilliant. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, remember when we said this will only be about 20 minutes? I remember when we said that. No, that's fine. Quite. You've given us more than enough material. Uh, I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in like MPW or something in the future and meeting you. Well, given, given my injury, I was about to head down, even though I could barely move. And uh, I was given a message that I mean, it would come you know, that they're happy to bring you back at MPW when you're, when you're fighting for that. Fantastic. Thought, you know what, they've, they've got such a good point, as much as I will never ever go out of a booking uh, yeah. unless I'm unable to move, this was the time when I was unable to move. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, like, you know, when I got my ultrasound scan after and found that I'd, I had you know, a tear, I hadn't torn my quad off the bone, mm-hmm. but I'd torn the muscle anyway, but I realised, you know what, wrestling... Uh, like I wrestled two weeks ago with a leg brace on yes and everyone said I was crazy but I did it I'm wrestling tomorrow and Sunday and then 
I've got a week off and I'm resting again, well, then the shows start. So I'm getting these week-long rest periods in between, yes. which is good. But at mm -hmm. the same time, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I can get through it and come out the end alive. <laughs> so, yes, uh, totally know it. I will be back down for MPW, and I'd really like to rekindle the relationship I had with... Like I've, 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 I've also this on, on the Spanish announce table yes. uh, show right here and now. Most of the times <laughs> I've been offered the chance to come down to full tilt and things have fallen through or whatever. Yes. I used to work with uh, 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 pro wrestling, uh, almost pro, shield pro wrestling. Almost pro shield pro, yeah, yeah. I used to work with them and uh, a lot of concepts that they had was unique and interesting and uh, I never actually was able to really commit because I was always wrestling somewhere else Yes, had I had already accepted the bookings ahead of their schedule and I think that's why I never got involved uh, yeah. as much as I should have done and the same with Uproar Championship Wrestling mm -hmm. I'm hoping to get back down there and I understand they've, they've all got their own rosters but I'm hoping that I can still offer something to these promotions this oh. is not me begging because I'm sure they'll happy yeah. it. it's me saying I am actually quite open to work in these places but <laughs> I do take the bookings quite quickly Yes. And uh, if I can do two shows in the one day, I will. Oh, right. If I can do several shows over a weekend, I will. But if uh, if people, you know, don't get back to me or they get back to me too late, I choose the first place. Of course, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm sure I'm sure we'll see you many times in, in the next uh, few months, of course. No, but, I uh, definitely hope so. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you for your time, and uh, I'll let you get back to whatever you're doing before. And with yeah, your well, see I was sitting down in a panda one. Okay, right, well, that sounds... But I can get back to doing that now, you know? Yeah, definitely, I mean, it's an important thing to do, isn't it? Um, yeah, <laughs> well, Neil, it's been a pleasure, thank you. Oh, well, definitely, it's been a pleasure to listen to you speak. Ages. I won't be offended if you edit any of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worry, we'll decide that, we'll leave that to, uh, to wait our main man uh, to do that sort of thing. So, um, I'll uh, thank you so much for your time, um, I'll let you get back to what you're doing, and thank you so much for you and Gene Mackey, and I uh, hope to see you again sometime. Excellent, Neil. Have a good day.